Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We worship you. Lord, we come to recognize that you are God, you are Lord, you are sovereign. And Lord, you are the Lord of this day. All the hours, all the moments, and all the people of God belong to you. Lord, we will not sit in the place of authority in your church. And then time you and say, this far you can go, you can go no further. Lord, humbly we submit ourselves to you. Humbly we give ourselves to you. And Lord, any time we come to your presence, we really come with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our attention. And we say, like the people of old, speak, for thy servants are hearing. Speak, Lord, today, for your children are hearing you in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading two verses of scriptures here. Verse 11 and verse 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Having your conversation, having your conduct, having your lifestyle, having your behavior, having your speech, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Glorify God in the day of visitation. As you live your life, as you interact with people in society, there's one thing you're looking for and you're looking at. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day of judgment. There is a day of visitation. And you want to live your life and project everything you do in such a way that there will be glory given to God on that day of visitation. Maybe people do not understand you now. Maybe people misrepresent or misunderstand whatever you do because you are a converted soul. You are a consecrated soul and you are a committed person. But they are not converted. They are not consecrated. They are not committed. And so when they look at you, you look somehow different. And instead of appreciating the difference, they condemn you. They judge you. They think you are eccentric. They think you are not doing the right thing because you are different from what they are used to. But that will not change you. That will not intimidate you. You are living, you are acting, you are behaving because of the day of visitation. Actually, the people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, their problem was they didn't know, they didn't realize, they didn't think of, they didn't focus on the day of visitation. Jeremiah chapter 51, I read from verse 18. Jeremiah chapter 51, reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, they are vanity. The work of errors in the time of their visitation, they shall perish. They were not looking at the coming day, at the day of visitation, at the day of reckoning, at the day of judgment, when the Almighty will sit on the throne 
and look at every detail of every moment of the days of their lives. And because they were ignorant or negligent about that day of visitation, it says the vanity, they became vain, lawless, the work of errors. There was error, sin, iniquity, fault in everything they did. They just lived their lives. Whether tomorrow will be a day of session or not, that did not care about. And whether they will make it on that day of visitation, did not care about. And because of that, they were vain, their work was of error. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. That will not happen to you. I say, chapter 10, I read from verse 1. I say, chapter 10, verse 1. Warn to them that decree unrighteous decrees they make unrighteous laws. Every new day, they make a new law to bind people, to destroy the will of God in their lives, to destroy the purpose of God for creating them, and they make laws to hinder them. Warn to them that decree unrighteous decrees that tried grievousness, which they have prescribed. Why? Look at verse 3. And what will you do in the day of visitation? They were ignorant of the day of visitation. Today is the only day they know. And they think that the Lord of this day and they can make a decree and make a law and do this and that. And it says, on the day of visitation, they will be surprised. What are they going to do? In the day of desolation, which shall come from far, to whom will you flee for help? If you have wasted your time, if you have had the opportunity and you have squandered that opportunity, and you are not thinking of the day of visitation, it says, to whom will you flee for hell, and where will you leave your glory? We're looking at Luke chapter 19. Jesus came to this world, and he came to the people of Israel. Again, that was a visitation from heaven, visitation of grace, and the visitation of love, and the visitation of divine help, and the visitation of the manifestation of the grace and the goodness and the power of God. Again, the children of Israel missed their chance. You will not miss your chance. 19, chapter 19 of Luke. I'm reading from verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou art known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, for thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because 
Church, tell me. Because, say that again. Say it as if you understand that can apply to us today. Because the time of the visitation, the day of the visitation, you can apply that locally. You've been praying for a long time. You've been asking for something. All those prayers have been in the bottle of God. And He decides a particular day of service. Maybe a Sunday, maybe a Monday, maybe a Thursday, maybe a Saturday, maybe a Tuesday. And he says, I remember him. Like he remembered Zechariah. And the angel came. And he says, that prayers are answered. They have come as a memorial. The man was old already. That was a day of visitation for him. What if he knew not the day of his visitation? Maybe you are there. You are fasting. You are waiting upon the Lord. You are asking this. You are asking this. You are asking that. And that day of fasting, nothing seems to have happened. And now you come. On this day, the day of the visitation. But you have forgotten your fasting. And when it should really bless you and answer your prayer according to his own plan on the day of visitation, it says they knew not the time, the day of their visitation. Extended. For each one on earth, there is a day of visitation when God says, you've done enough on earth. Come yonder. And there are people that live their lives, they are ignorant, they are negligent of the day of visitation when God will say, that's enough, come back home. And they live haphazardly. And they live carelessly. And they live selfishly. And they live thoughtlessly because they are ignorant of the day of visitation. The day of rapture will be a day of visitation for the whole church when the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. There are people that live their days without ever thinking rapture will take place. They fall into this pitfall. They fall into that corruption. They fall into that society. And they do whatever. And they are ignorant that rapture could take place anytime. And there are people that live their lives without understanding, without remembering that there is a day God has appointed and you will sit on the white throne and will judge the whole of humanity. And here we are told that Jesus wept over Jerusalem because they knew not the time of their visitation. Come back to 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, I read from verse 11 again. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, against your soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God when? Tell me, tell me. When? In the day of visitation, the subject we are looking at today, the believer's preservation till the day of visitation. The believer's preservation until the day of visitation. Three things we are looking at. Number one, the affection of strangers 
and pilgrims in the world. Their affection and their attention and their activities and everything that is done by strangers and pilgrims in the world. Verse 11 tells us, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. And so, as we see ourselves as strangers in the world and pilgrims in the world, we need to search our affection on things above our heavenly home because here we're just passing through point number two abstaining from fresh lusts and polluting warfare abstaining from fleshly lusts and polluting warfare verse 11 abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Fleshly lust will wage war against the saints, against strangers and pilgrims as we pass through the world. And it says there's something to do because you focus your attention on the final day on the day of visitation, you always obtain. Temptation will come. You say, no, that's not for me. This is not my home. I don't want that kind of pleasure. I'm looking at the pleasure of the final day, the day of visitation. Abstaining from fleshly lusts and polluting warfare. Point number three. The acceptable conversation. The acceptable conversation. There are many kinds of conversation. You hear from your neighbors. You see from your friends. You see from your household. You see in the office. And you see everywhere. The way they comport, conduct, themselves and the way they fight on issues and the way they live for today because they are not citizens of the coming heavenly kingdom and it says you because of who you are you have acceptable conversation that is honest that is helpful, that is holy, that is heavenly among the Gentiles, and they will speak against you as evil doers is stingy. He doesn't contribute money for the public good. The public good is for idol, so that the idols will have mercy on them and allow their market to go well allow their commun communities to be free from powers in the air and so they contribute money and you are not contributing the money you are not doing well that's an evil doer he doesn't want progress he turns away from all the things that will bring good to society is too heavenly minded is of no earthly good and so they speak evil of you as evil doers but as they behold your good works which they shall behold they glorify God in the day of visitation and somebody said amen, amen. the acceptable conversation of saints with rewardable works. The acceptable conversation of saints with rewardable works. Point number one, the affection of strangers and pilgrims in the world. Look at verse 11. Dearly beloved, 
Those are believers. Dearly beloved, those are converted people. Dearly beloved, they are washed in the blood of the Lamb. They have turned away from sin and they have turned to the Savior. They have turned away from darkness and they have turned to Christ, the light of the world. They have turned away from the, from the pollutions of the world and they have turned unto the one that is able to cleanse and able to purify. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, as strangers and pilgrims, that's what we are in the world. The affection of strangers and pilgrims in the world. In Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 19. Psalm 119, verse 19. I am a stranger in the earth. That's the psalmist. That's a person who knows God. That's a person who knows that the end of life on earth is not the end of existence. We're going to another place. And he says, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. Because your commandments come from my heavenly city, heavenly country. And that's my country, my future place of abode. And it's the commandments coming from there that will reveal to me how to have a change, a conversion, a transformation that will eventually take me to my home. Hide not your commandments from me. Verse 54. In verse 54, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Verse 19, I'm a stranger. Verse 54, I am a pilgrim. Verse 57, Thou art my portion, O Lord, in my house of pilgrimage, in my place as a stranger, all my life here, as I'm a stranger and a pilgrim, thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said, I will keep thy words. Verse 72. In verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Thousands of gold and silver. The measure, the currency of that day. He could have said millions and billions of naira and dollars. That your word, the word of your mouth, is more important to me, better than thousands of silver and gold. Why? Because on the day of reckoning, all the millions and the billions you have, whether you have it properly or you have it by fraud, all the millions will not matter. All the billions will not matter. The Word of God that makes us know about salvation, about holiness without which, without which no man shall save the Lord, the word of the Lord that makes us to conduct our lives aright. That's what will matter on the day of visitation. Therefore, that word is more important to me than thousands of gold and silver. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The laws of God are permanent. The laws of God are constant. The decrees of the world are changing. The laws of the world are changing. And we're strangers here. We're not bothered by all the decrees, all the laws they're making. But we walk by the law of God, the word of God, and forever, O oh Lord, 
thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. While I walk through this earth, while I move on in this world, while I go step by step towards my heavenly home, your word is the light in my pathway. And your word is a lamp unto my feet. Verse 1, 12. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, every day, all the time, even unto the end. Verse 133. In verse 133, order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. What's your affection? As you think of your life, and you are passing through this world, and you are like a stranger, and a pilgrim. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 11. I read from verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. The promises. The Lord gave them promises. Some of them, those promises were for earthly things, physical things, land, houses, material things, Possession, whatever, those physical things they were promised. There were also spiritual blessings, salvation, forgiveness, freedom from sin, sanctification, holiness, the qualification for heaven. There were also eternal blessings reserved for them in heaven, they set their affections on heavenly blessings, heavenly promises, spiritual blessings, spiritual promises. If the Lord saw to it that the earthly blessings and promises will aid them, help them towards their heavenly journey, all right. But if the earthly blessings, earthly promises will hinder them from concentrating on the heavenly and the eternal, they'll let that go. Look at that verse again. These all died in faith, not having received the physical earthly promises. But having seen them afar off, the land that he had promised, and they saw that afar off, and they knew the Lord at his own time will give that land to their descendants. So they let that go. They saw it afar off, and they were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They knew they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And they were seeking a country, a better country, a heavenly country. It says they declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, really, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is and heavenly. 
Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And that was the heavenly city they concentrated on. And we as strangers and pilgrims, that's the country we focus our attention on. The heavenly city, for what will it profit a man, profit a woman? If you gain everything on earth and then you lose your soul, what shall a man, what shall a woman give in exchange for his own soul, for her own soul? Chapter 13 of Hebrews, reading from verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. He suffered outside the gate. He suffered for our salvation. As no tongue can tell. And we need to look up to him and say, Lord, you want me in heaven. You want me to realize I'm just a stranger here. Whether I do or not, I'll be packed into a box and then they dig the ground, put me inside and then I'm forgotten. I better realize now I'm just a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. And because of that, you died on the cross of Calvary so that I'll be saved, so that my life will be all right, prepared for that heavenly country. Then in verse 13, verse 12, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him, without the camp, Bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city. We're strangers and pilgrims here. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. What's our affection then? What do we search? affection our attention on Colossians chapter 3 in Colossians chapter 3 reading from verse 1 if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above that's your final place of abode that's the eternal habitation that's the country, the better country, the heavenly country above. And if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. There are many things on earth, and they give you the downward pull if you set your affection on them, you set your affection on anything, anyone on earth, it will act like a downward pull. And when the picture of heaven is presented unto you, the zeal, the excitement, the joy, the happiness to go forth and enter, will not be there. The sin and the one, the material things, the man or the woman, or the work, or the job, you set your affection on will act like a downward pull, the force of gravity on your life. But set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Think for a moment, what is it on the earth that is so near your heart, so precious to you, 
If God were to call you home today, that you'll say, God, give me chance, give me time. I'm not ready to go yet. My affection is set on things on the earth. That's going to be dangerous. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. You are dead to the things of the world. You are dead to the attractions of the world. You are dead to the slaveholders of the world. You see, there are people, they are like slaveholders. They put chain in your hand, chain around your waist, chain around your feet. They control where you go. They put a padlock on your mouth. They control what you say. They put high style sunglasses on your eyes. They control what you see. They control virtually everything. And they say, thus far, you will not go. They don't want you to, want you to see heaven or the glories of heaven. They don't want to see the beauties of the glory awaiting you. They don't want to see about your calling and what God has created you for, what God sent you to the world to do. And if you're going to get to heaven easily and you're setting your affections on things above, you are dead to all those slaveholders. You are dead and your life is seen with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Thank God you'll be there. Okay, thank God I will be there. Will be there in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 3. First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away. Look at this. Reserved in heaven for you. Reserved. Tell me. Reserved. Say it aloud. Reserved in heaven for you. The greatest thing you will have is not now. The highest thing you will have it's not now. The greatest reward you will have is not now. And the greatest joy you will have is not now. It's reserved for you in heaven where strangers and pilgrims on the earth and we're going to the heavenly city and the joy, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the happiness we have is that there is something greater, higher, more beautiful, more precious than anything we have on earth. But that thing is reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. John chapter 17 John chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 14 John 17 verse 14 I have given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. 
were strangers and pilgrims there, were not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world. I am not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then it says in verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me will be with me where I am. Where is Jesus now? In heaven? That's the final home, the heavenly home, the heavenly country, the better country. And Jesus said, were well, strangers and pilgrims here, we are not of the world. And he says, Father, I will that they whom thou hast given me will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. I pray your life will be a life that shows that you are a stranger in this world, a pilgrim in this world, and you set your affection on that heavenly country to which the Lord is preparing you. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. It will win your heart away from the imprisonment of the world in Jesus' name. Point number two now, abstaining from fleshly lusts and polluting warfare. I'm coming back to First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, strangers and pilgrims, abstain, those who search their mind, their hearts, their affections on things above, abstain, those who are going towards heaven, and they want to make heaven the final place of eternal habitation. Abstain. Those who are following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who says, I want all my disciples to be where I am, in the heavenly city. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, fleshly lusts, fleshly desires, inordinate affection, concentration on the things that pull you with the flesh and pull you by the flesh and pull you into degradation, abstain. First Peter chapter 4 Verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself, equip yourself, fortify yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I stopped sinning. I stopped yielding to the affections of the world and the fleshly lost. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will 
of God. He wants us to abstain from the lusts of the flesh so that that day of visitation will not come upon us on our wares in Jesus' name. First John chapter 2 verse 15 Love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the Father is not in him if anyone gives more attention to the world than he gives to the Lord that's the love of the world if anyone will deny himself and pay whatever price the world demands to get the world and to have the world and you will not pay a fraction of that price for God and for the things of the, of the Lord, he loves the world. He's willing to sacrifice his very life, even his family, for the things of the world, but he's not willing to sacrifice anything for the things of the Lord. He's willing to sacrifice his children, throw them away, to a faraway place in the pursuit of the things of the world. He cannot sacrifice and give those children to the Lord in pursuit of the things of God. He loves the world. Love not the world, not that the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of, love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, somebody tell me there, abideth forever. That will be true of you. Will abide forever with the Lord in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Look the beloved physician and Demas greet you. Paul the apostle and the apostle was writing to the Colossian believers. And he said, I have some companions here. I have some co-workers here. I have some people here that love the Lord like I do with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. There was me here and I want them to give you their greetings. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Demas was in the Lord. Philemon, Philemon, only one chapter. Philemon, verse 23, verse 24. Dear salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcos, Aristarchus, tell me the next name here. Tell me now. Let me hear you. Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Now come back. To Second Timothy chapter four, verse ten. Second Timothy chapter four, verse ten. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world. Demas was one time a Christian, a beloved Christian. 
a fellow laborer of Paul the Apostle. But worldly lusts attracted him, warring against his soul. He couldn't overcome. You will overcome. Demons has forsaken me, having loved the present world. First Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 6. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things. Whatever blocks your view of heaven, it's an evil thing. Whatever deadens your conscience, that you are no more sensitive to the voice of the Spirit, is an evil thing. Whatever storms your journey on your way to heaven, and you're no more interested in the Bible, no more interested in the commandments of the Lord, no more interested in heaven, all you want now is something physical, something earthly, something material that is evil. Whatever takes your passion and your interest away from the things of God, and now you're no more praying on that. All you want now is this particular idol. That's an evil thing. Now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things, as they also lost it. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to play, to drink, and they rose up to eat, to drink, and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication. Neither commit fornication, as some of them committed, and they fell in one day day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, neither complain, neither grumble, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the serpents. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh and standeth take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common unto man. But God is faithful. Our God is faithful. Who will not suffer you, permit you, allow you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Now there are people who are not worshipping idols of wood, idols of iron, or idol created made like the one we got Nizarista. But money has become an idol. They'll give up Sunday worship for making money. They'll give up their spiritual life because of their pursuit of money. They'll give up the church. If the church hinders me 
from living a fraudulent, dubious life, and they're always talking about it, they'll forsake the church for money. They'll forsake their conviction for money. Anything you can forsake your conviction about, that becomes an idol. An idol you fear, an idol you love, an idol you give yourself, you bury yourself into. Little children flee from idolatry. Say amen. First Timothy chapter 6, I read from verse 5. First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 5. Perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. They measure godliness but how much of the things of the world they have. They measure progress, spiritual progress, by how much of material things they possess. Supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, they will say they must be rich. They whose goal and dream is for earthly things, they that will be rich by all means fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil. There are those who are quick to say, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil, right? I don't have the love of money, but you do. Your waking thought, your sleeping plan, your days, your activities of the day, it's all working for money, planning for money, strategizing for money. How big, how much? It's into millions. When it will get into billions, that's what you're thinking about every time. And then you say, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. You have it already. The love of money, your concentration on money, your planning on money. Your friendship is determined by how much money you have. Your interaction is determined by how much money you have. And your allegiance to anyone is determined by how much money you have. And your marriage is built on how much money that woman will help you to have. How much money that a man will be shoveling to you. That's the love of money. It says for the love of money. It's the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the face, they are no more in the face, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Those things were against our soul. And the Lord wants us to get rid of them and to focus our attention on things in heaven and not on things on the earth. He wants us to abstain from fleshly lusts, fleshly desires, and fleshly affection, the things that war against our soul. Micah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 10. Micah chapter 2 verse 10. Arise ye and depart. 
For this is not your rest. Remember once again, we are strangers and pilgrims here. Arise ye and depart. For this is not your rest, because it is polluted, and it shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. I pray nothing on this earth will destroy your soul in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Read from verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of, tell me, evil. Fornication is evil. Abstain from all appearance of fornication. Adultery is evil. Abstain from all appearance of adultery. I didn't do anything. Why did you stay inside? A room with a lady by yourself and the door was closed. I didn't do anything. That's an appearance of evil. I didn't steal anything. What did you scratch that thing on the seat? What did you try to change something? That's an appearance of fraud. Abstain from every appearance of fraud. The way you dress, I'm a Christian. I'm old enough in this, our church, to know how to dress decently. I understand, sister. All this sunshine that were put there, when you collect all the sunshine together from your shoe, from your dress, if you put everything together, it's more than the earrings you are not putting on. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You are shouting and shouting, and you are pointing finger. Brother, are you angry? Uh-uh, I'm a child of God. Children of God don't get angry. But your eyes are red, and you are pointing finger, and you are shouting, and you are saying, if you do that again, I'm not angry. Okay, that's an appearance of anger. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Yeah, everything is quiet now, and things are okay. Somebody there smashed a plate on the ground and broke it. What's happening there? Is somebody angry there? And then you peep, no, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. But I don't like what's taking place. And I needed to catch your attention. That's why I dropped that thing and made that sound. That's an appearance of evil. You know, if we're going to heaven, we're thoughtful, we're careful, we're spiritual. We're not carnal. We're not getting to the edge of the Christian life almost falling over and manifesting appearances of sin. It says if we're children of God, meekness and gentleness and love and mercy and goodness shall characterize our lives. But the way we live that shows we're grinding something, we're angry at something, and we're fighting against something, all the appearance of evil, the Lord is saying, abstain from all appearance of evil. God will grant you grace. God will grant me grace. Second Peter, I'm reading from chapter 2. Verse 17, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved 
forever. The people who do not live right, whether publicly or privately, who have forgotten that they need to abstain from all fleshly lust, and they don't abstain. It says it's reserved for them the blackness of darkness forever. I pray that will not be your Lord. Always remember there's a reckoning day. Always remember there is a judgment day. Always remember there is a visitation day in everything you do. I give all your heart, all your mind, all your strength to serving the Lord. And if any sin will distract your attention from the heavenly journey, abstain from them that try to war against your soul. You will not fall. For when they speak great, swelling words of vanity, they are lured through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that are clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome. Evil will not overcome you. Anger will not overcome you. Malice will not overcome you. Sin will not overcome you. Demons will not overcome you. Of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. I pray that will not be your Lord in Jesus' name. We we'll come back now to chapter two of First Peter. First Peter chapter two. I'm reading here from verse twelve. First Peter chapter two. We're reading from verse 12. The acceptable conversation of saints with rewardable works. Verse 12. Having your conversation honest among Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, your good works, rewardable works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. The Lord wants us to set a conversation right, our speech right, our conduct right, our lifestyle right, our character right. Psalm 50 verse 5. In Psalm 50, verse 5, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Who are those kinds of people? Verse 23, whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that order, ordereth his conversation. Aright. You are a child of God. You are beloved. You are a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth. You are on your way to glory land. You offer, you order your conversation aright. Him will I show the salvation of God. I pray you'll order your conversation aright. You'll have to forsake the old way of speaking, the old manner of character, and the old lifestyle. First Peter chapter 1. 
In First Peter chapter one, reading from verse fourteen, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Conduct, character, should reflect and portray and convey holiness of life, holiness in your understanding. Look at verse 18 for as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, vain conversation. You are redeemed from that. You are cleansed from that. The conversation, the character, the conduct, the lifestyle of, of the past, you are redeemed from that. That leads to vanity. You are cleansed from that. You are redeemed from vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. I pray the Lord will help us in our conversation, in our manner of life, in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 2. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1, verse 2. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your husbands. Don't be bossy on your husband. The husband is the head of the home. Whatever you have that the man may not have, whatever you possess, the man may not possess. Here is the scripture. Don't be bossy over your husband. Likewise, ye wives, be subject to your own husbands. There are some wives that are in subjection to their manager, to their director, to their leaders in the company, the corporation, more than they are to their husbands at home. Turn it around and be in subjection to your husband. There are wives, women, who are in subjection more to their sectional leader in the church. And they're not in subjection in that way, at that level, to their husbands at home. Turn it around. Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, any obey not, it's not talking about your word, there are some wives that set up laws in the family. And the husband is supposed to bend and obey the law of the wife in the family. That's not it. That's not scriptural. If any man does not obey the word, the word of God, they also may without the word, you are not preaching at your husband, be won by the conversation, conversation, the lifestyle of the wife, the manner of the wife, the conduct of the wife. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, your husband is not supposed to fear you. You are to fear your husband. It's an authority. It's the authority in the family. Chapter three, First Peter, chapter three. I'm reading from verse fifteen. First Peter, chapter three, verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. Don't say your conscience. Having a good conscience, don't harden your conscience. Having a good conscience, don't deaden your conscience. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your. Tell me. Ah, the church is quiet. That falsely accuse you of your. Good conversation in Christ. You are living in Christ. Have a good, good conversation. Good conversation. 
because on the final day that his watch will count. The acceptable conversation of saints with rewardable works. In Second Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, I read from verse 11. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. All the things of the world will be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Holy conversation and godliness. Looking for and hasting on to the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. I pray you'll be there. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without sport, and blameless. God will give you the grace. We'll be blameless in Jesus' name. We'll come back to First Peter chapter 2. I'm reading now from verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king a supreme, don't attack the president of the country. Don't speak against either in the papers, over the radio, over television, on the internet, YouTube, Twitter, whatever. Don't speak in the governor of the state, the leaders in the state. Have a comportment, have a character that is subdued, that is Christianly. Verse 14, our governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. This is the will of God. That our character, our comportment will be subdued, will be under subjection, under obedience. So, so is the will of God that with well doing, not by rioting, ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, free from sin and not using your liberty as a cloak, as a cover, pretense for maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor how many people? Honor all men. Don't do anything to anyone that you should disrespect or dishonor. Honor all men in the church, outside the church, your community, anywhere, everywhere. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Honor the king. Don't disrespect the king, the leaders in the community, or the leaders in the church. And if we're to honor the leaders in the community, how much more the leaders in the church? If we're to honor the governor in the state, how much more your pastor who is leading you in the way to heaven. Honor the king. Honor your pastor. Give me a good amen. amen. Verse 18, servants, be subjects to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the fraud, to the ones that do not please you well. They are not very thoughtful in their leadership and management. The subject unto your masters 
even to the fraud. Look at that verse 18. Let me read it and find out what is wrong in the reading. Are you ready? Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, only to the good and gentle, but not to the fraud. Is that right? I said, is that right? No. But that's how some people, that's how some people behave. It's gentle, it's nice, it's proactive, it's sympathetic, it's compassionate, and he robs us the right direction. We'll fear him, we'll honor him, we'll respect him. That other one, he doesn't have good management, good leadership skill. And we have to show him by disrespecting him. No, not at all. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the fraud. Look at verse, that verse 18. Let me read it another way. And tell me whether it's right or wrong. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Masters, be subject to your servants well, with all fear. Not only to the good servants and gentle servants, but also to the forward servants. Is that right? That's what happens in the world. The servants from the gate, the servants to the cleaners, the servants to the rest of the servants, they want the director, the manager, the master to be subject to them with all fear. Not only to the good servants, but to the forward and to the lousy servants. The church shall not be like that. We will not be like that. You will not be like that in Jesus' name. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, with all reverence, with all meekness, not only to the good and gentle, but to the fraud, but also to the fraud, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what is each if when he be buffeted? For your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes somebody there tell me you are healed for ye were sheep going astray but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls the Lord has given us his word and has shown us in minute details and we need to return to him as Savior. Return to him as a shepherd. Return to him as a sanctifier. And we're to be submissive, completely submissive unto him 
and to the leadership he has given us in the church and uh, in the community, in the country, and in our corporations and offices where we are working. We need grace to do that. And the grace of God is available. And after we have had the word of God for so long, we need now to come to the Lord and give ourselves unto the Lord and examine our lives with the word of God in detail and say, Lord, I know I've not been there. I've not been living like stranger and pilgrim in this world. I've not been abstaining from all the fleshly laws warring against my soul. I have not been ordering my conversation right and I've not been submissive and subje being subjected unto my masters in the office and also unto my leader in the church. Oh Lord, help me and grant me your grace. He will grant you his grace. I said he will grant you his grace. And we're going to spend quality time in praying unto the Lord so that should the day of visitation come at any moment, at any time, by the grace of God, when the trumpet sounds, I will go. When the trumpet sounds, I will go. And when it says, go marching in, you'll be there marching in with all the saints in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and pour our hearts before the Lord and let's uh, really speak to the Lord and say, Lord, we want a change, we want a transformation in our individual lives, we want that change in our families, we want that change in the local church, we want that change in our church at large, we want that change, we want you to come with a surgical knife from heaven and cut off and cut away everything that should not be in our lives. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord as people who love the word of God accept the word of God rejoice in the word of God and say this day a change a transformation will happen do it for me O Lord and the Lord will do it in your life in Jesus name